Hey, this is Josh Chevalier. I'm the college fantasy football lead over at Fantasy Points. Welcome to the CFF All Access Podcast, where you are being uh, introduced behind the curtain into the best conversations in college fantasy football. Let's get started. Hey guys, again, hey, this is Josh Chevalier. I'm joined today by my boy, Zach Hall at CFF Champs. I'm excited to have him on with me. We have lost our two other companions this week, Mike Bainbridge and Eric Froton. They were both at a bachelor party this week and they've gone missing in Miami. And uh, But we're pretty confident we'll have them back next week. Actually, Froton is at a Boston Bruins game tonight in Miami with a bunch of his boys. So we're missing him, but he's a Boston dude. So we're excited for him to be able to see uh, his boys play hockey. But the show must go on. And so here we are. Um, today's main topic for us, we're going to be talking about the top play callers in CFF for QBs, but with a slight twist. We're actually going to be talking about uh, some things these play callers have in common. One, all of these play callers rank within the top 25 in QB fantasy points per game. In fact, six of the seven are in the top 15. And then second, all of them have QBs being drafted in round 10 and beyond. And so we didn't want to pick guys that are, you know, like Mac Weflich at Texas State or Will Stein at Oregon, you know, guys that are, you know, uh, our boy Alex Golish at South Florida, all guys that have QBs going in the top three rounds. You guys don't need to hear about this stuff. You guys know who to choose there. So we wanted to give you guys some guys that are more values in draft, guys that are being drafted outside the top 24 QBs, um, non-starters. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to get into seven of those play callers tonight, and it should be a great show. We're excited to do this. But before we do that, I wanted to run through some quick spring uh, camp news um, and some quick hitters here and have a little bit of a conversation on things that are going on because we got spring camps going on. and. Um, yeah, we want to want to get into that and, and talk about what we have going on in camps. So the first spring camp we want to get into a little bit was Miami. Miami's got Cam Ward that they brought in this offseason after uh, quite a bit of recruiting that they did. He went to the NFL draft. He came back and decided that he was going to play for Miami in his last year. Got a fat NIL deal. And I think there's a lot of questions about whether, you know, Cam Ward was going to live up to that that hype. And Man, in camp right now, like the buzz is unbelievable. And so I think he's a pretty interesting um, value to me in, in drafts, right? Like he's going, um, his ADP overall is 99. And so that's right around the eighth round. He is the 20th quarterback off the board. Um, and so my question, uh, you know, for you, Zach, like what do you think? Do you think that Cam Ward – is he a value right now in the eighth round as the QB 20 or is he going too high or is this just right? Yeah. I, so I feel like that's about right. That's kind of where I expected him um, to, to start going. We have him as QB 26 in the rankings right now. Um, mm-hmm. So he's right around there. Um, maybe, maybe it's, it's a little bit high. Um, but, but I also think Cam, Cam Ward is one of those guys where um we were really excited about him two years ago. Um, and we just, last year we kind of fell off and, um, he's one of those guys I kind of want to see, you know, have that, have that good year, um, coming up this year. And so I I like where he's going right now. I wouldn't want to take him any higher than that. Um, I don't know if I don't expect him to really fall too much, um, below that. So I think it's a, it's, it's a good spot for him. I, I would have probably wait maybe a round or two more for him, but I think, I think his spot right now is, is, pretty solid yeah yeah i think when he's falling in the ninth or tenth round man he's great great value right and especially like you and i have been talking a lot you know uh behind the scenes and just like man miami's running attack right now is a big question mark yeah and so it's like if they don't have a running game then he might really have to air it out and the wide receivers at least the top four um, Jojo traders, again, the true freshman has a lot of buzz coming in. I mean, insiders from Miami saying he's the best wide receiver in 20 years that's come in. Um, you have Jacoby George, who was the number three, um, in yards in the conference. And then you had Xavier Strepo, who was number two in the conference last year. And then you have Isaiah Horton. So you have four wide receivers there that could be pretty good. And man, if Ward has weapons, 
um, and Miami doesn't have a run game, so he gets some goal line carries, like he could be a real value in drafts. Yeah, and that's one of the good, one of those guys when when I was rolling through projections, um, it was probably a little bit more on the conservative side, but that ceiling feels feels higher than than where he's actually at right now. And I like that point you brought up about some of those goal line carries, right? If if they don't have that running back, healthy running back back there, I mean he's gonna he's gonna get some of those. So I think there's there's definitely upside um, from where we have him right now um, projected as well. So yeah, good value. Yeah. I totally agree. All right. Second player we're going to talk about, we're going to go over to Georgia and uh, another Georgia bulldog has gotten caught with the DUI. Tell me if you've heard this one before. Um, you know, there's a whole hit piece last off season uh, on Georgia and kind of how they handle these things. And, and then Trevor Etienne comes in, right. Running back from Florida comes in, transfers in supposed to be the RB one, potentially like a higher bell cow role, according to um, Jared Palmgren who's a big Georgia fan, another guy that has a great CFF podcast. Um, And then this man gets arrested. And so, you know, uh, the question I think really is, okay, say he has a one or two game suspension. Um, Does that hurt his value in your eyes? Like he's currently going round eight, um, just like Cam Ward um, around, I think, end of like your RB3 range, starting to get in your RB4 um what are you doing with trevor Etienne? is he, are you gonna like i've seen him start to drop a couple rounds in drafts but what what, what do you think should we drop him should we keep him the yeah. same no i you know I, so for me personally i thought he was going maybe a little bit too high anyways um yeah i kind of refer back to our projections the confidence rating wasn't great on him so it felt like it was it was a little bit higher than i would have liked personally um this might help it correct a little bit i don't think his the impact's going to be that huge on his overall season, right? We're talking um, if we if he misses one or two games at the beginning of the year, um, maybe maybe there's going to be a little bit of an impact. I don't I don't see this really changing his draft position too much. I think we'll probably still see him going in that same range. Um, yeah, so I, I don't I don't think there will be too much of an impact. Maybe drop a round or two, but overall, I think I think it'll stay pretty steady. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, I mean, if you start dropping a couple rounds, I'm going to, I'm going to like that value because he is a guy that, you know, there's an interesting relationship to between CFF and Debbie analysts, right? Debbie analysts can actually be on guys um, uh, before us, right? Because they are looking at freshmen and stuff like that. And they look at, you know, potential impact of the pro level. So some of this, like they have a really good eye for analyzing these up and coming players. And ETN is one of those that's been identified as like a top, top five Debbie running back in a lot of people's eyes. And, um, and so he could have a lot of potential, but you know, we know that Georgia likes to split carries, but if he's going to drop a couple rounds, then he starts to get put in that range where I like him. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things before we even started these drafts, he was a guy that I kind of had um, as thinking maybe he would go a little bit later than where he was. And that value would be great. Again, like I said, he's going just above where I would want to take him probably a few rounds where I'd take him. But yeah, he's definitely a guy. If he starts to drop, I'm, I'm going to jump all over that. Um, start adding him to some of these teams that I'm drafting. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And you know, in best ball or in redraft, right. When you draft ETN, like if he's suspended for the first couple of games, like we're, you're going to have enough information, especially if you're listening to this podcast or got your, you know, yeah. um, your ear to the ground, like, to be able to go, all right, who are the guys I can pick up that can score 20 points? Because there's lots of guys, right, with all the F, F, FBS teams that are playing FCS opponents that we can pick up and identify and go, well, yeah, we can put them in our lineups and they're going to score 20 points. And so the first couple of weeks are pretty easy to do that. So don't let um, a potential one or two game suspension derail you, um, right. you know, from picking this guy. All right, next guy we got, our next team, we're traveling down south just a little bit to the Florida State Seminoles. And I want to talk about a guy that uh, was a little disappointing last year for me, Millie Benson. He was, um, you know, coming into camp last year at Alabama, like there was some potential that he would be a top wide receiver there. And then he never really panned out. Didn't get, he didn't get on the field much. And when he did, he didn't really um, do much. But now he's over at Florida State. 
Um, and probably in a little bit of a simpler system uh, with Mike Norvell. And, you know, Norvell has kind of said, hey, what do I want on my team? I want speed, right? Last year he had two giants on the outside with Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson. And then now he's going, all right, like we're going to transition. So you got Jalen Lucas, you got Jalen Brown from LSU, a little known freshman. Um, and then he got Malik Benson. And what do these guys all have in common? It's speed. And Malik Benson runs a 10 4 100 meter. And he's just been a standout throughout the offseason. I, I pay attention quite a bit to Florida State and just report after report is talking about Malik Benson and how fluid he is and um, how much they're expecting him to do in the system. And then that has not stopped since camp started, um, where they are really, you know, hyping him up. And right now he's going, you know, round 26. This is ADP. <laughs> Um, you know, your hundredth wide receiver. Um, we haven't projected right at 14.4 points per game, wide receiver 77. So we're pretty conservative on that projection, but also like, you know, that's what 23 spots higher than what he's going. So what do you what do you think we should do? What do you what do what, what's your take on Malik Benson? Yeah, so um really good value right now. And this is this is a guy. That I feel like Josh um, keeps sending me uh, articles and <laughs> and just yes. anything on this guy so that I will bump up this projection because um, I feel like if, if it was up to him, this projection would be a lot higher. Um, but like you mentioned, great value right now where he's going, you know, in the 100th wide receiver and even at 77, um, he's, he's a great value. The one thing that, that I guess – kind of trips me up here is when Mike Norvell went to Florida state, we just have not seen the volume at yeah. that receiver position um, that you would want to see the consistency to have kind of a, a higher um, wide receiver. I mean, Keon Coleman was, is his best receiver he's had um, CFF wise or fantasy fantasy points wise. He had 15.2 last year. Um, and really the, the big reason for that is 11 touchdowns. I mean, that drove, that drove a lot of his points and uh, he hasn't had a receiver over 90 targets yet at Florida state. So yeah. if you go back to Memphis, um, it's a whole different story, right? There, they had um, some, some really uh, high end receiver production there, but since we've been at Florida, since he's been at Florida state, it just hasn't been there yet. Um, you mentioned that projections conservative, um, definitely could see that being more um, not close to that ceiling of, of where he could be um, in that offense. But for me personally, um, I've kind of stayed away from any Florida State receiver just the yeah. last few years. Um, and I would kind of, I'm kind of at the, I I'm, won't believe it until I see it. Um, yeah. You see the reports and I like guys, you know, like Josh said, he's got the speed. Um, he's, sounds like he's killing it in practice um so the potential is there but for me um i love the value right now he's a guy that i feel like with all these reports coming out and we got people on twitter talking about him right posting stuff about how good he's doing it's almost like i feel like he could overcorrect, right so yeah. he's going at 100 now and then he starts to go way too early um so i'd be careful about that of where guys really start to take him it might not happen but i could see that potentially happening here where it overcorrects but definitely even in, if you're getting him in that um you know those mid-teens like that's still going to be a really good value i think especially in a um a best ball where even if he doesn't put it together all year he's going to have some really good weeks there's just going right. to be some really solid weeks and he's going to be a good um, receiver on your team. He's a guy that I would probably look to add when I'm drafting is maybe like a wide receiver six on my, on my roster, right? You kind of fill it up with, with some really solid guys and then um, bring him in and, and hope you're going to get some weeks and then hit that, hit that ceiling um, that we have seen in the system, just not in the last few years. Yeah. And so that's like wide receiver, what 60 something to 70 something. If you're talking about wide receiver six range and, Mm -hmm. So that's right in the range that we have them, right? Because like you start getting into decimal points when you start talking about some of these projections oh, yeah. and where guys land, right? But yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, counterpoint to FSU, right, is 
Jordan Travis. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, he's got a style of game that's not going to lend itself to the type of production that we had when he was at Memphis and he had more true pocket passers. And I would say DJU is more in that mold. I mean, certainly not as consistent as, you know, some of the old, you know, quarterbacks that they had. Yeah. Uh, but, but Malik Benson is more in the role uh, mold of kind of a speedy outside wide receiver um, can actually transition inside outside. Like a lot of those guys could back in the day. Yeah. In Memphis as well. So we'll yeah. see though. I mean, the thing here, right. Is value. It's like yeah. drafting is all about value. And so you'll, you'll, if he was going in the 10th round and we'd be like, this is, this is dumb, but you know, and the 26th round, it's like, yeah, take Love your it. shot and, and go like as high as 16, 17, right. Where you're starting to really throw more darts at that point. Yep. So that's good. All right. So we're going to transition. We want to each week. We want to hit on some spring news, right? And things going on because camps are really starting to heat up. And once we hit April sixth, thirteenth, right, we're going to start getting some actual, um, you know, spring games and uh, really be able to talk about that stuff. So we'll have more information on that um, every week. But we want to get to our main segment this week, our main topic, and that is, like I mentioned before. Historical play callers, top play callers for QBs. And again, the slight twist. So these are guys, right? All these play callers are in the top 25 for QB fantasy points per game. Six of these seven play callers we're going to hit on tonight are in the top 15, right? So these are really good play callers. Um, and they all have QBs that are being drafted in rounds 10 and beyond. Um, and so none of these are top 24 QBs. So these are all guys that we would say say our values right and so i'm gonna hit on i'm just gonna name the seven q seven uh play callers that we're gonna be talking about tonight and um and then we can go through and talk through the th the four things that we're gonna discuss for each play caller three things one their history right so we have lots of data on their on their history as a play caller so we're gonna go through that their projected qb1 or the battle and then that that qb's adp the current situation at the school. So what are the, what's the wide receiver room like? And then we'll discuss whether we think these guys, whether you should actually take a shot on them um, and, and where they're going in the draft. So good. So the, the seven historical play callers we're going to hit on. The first is Robert and I, he's a North Carolina state OC. We have major Applewhite, who is the head coach at South Alabama, but he's also the play caller. Jeff Lebby, same thing. He's the head coach at Mississippi State, but also the play caller. Eric Morris, same thing at North Texas. Mike Shanahan, um, not the same one from back in the day winning championships with the Broncos, but uh, this one is former Pittsburgh wide receiver and Indiana OC for Kurt Signetti there. So former JMU OC, um, who's produced some <laughs> – Produced a lot with a little over the last couple of years at QB. And then Sean Lewis, who's the San Diego State head coach um, and also play caller. And then Ben Arbuckle, who's at Washington State as the OC there. Um, so those are the seven that we're going to go over. And we're going to start with my favorite. I'm going to go back and forth. I'm going to take one and then um, and Zach will take one and kind of explain who they are and their profile. And then, um, and then we'll have some discussions on them. So first one, Robert and I, again, he's the NC State OC. Again, historically, he was at UVA um, for a long time. He was there with Bryce Perkins. He had um, our boy, uh, the ginger, Brendan Armstrong. Um, and then he also had a year with Garrett Schrader there at Syracuse. Um, and so he, uh, man, I'm going to go the last six years, really, because that's when he started using a dual threats, right? And so he uses dual threats for the last six years. They're averaging 27.6 fantasy points per game over that time, which ranks number ninth in the country. Um, and the average pass numbers are 2,800 yards um, per game. Or sorry, per game. That would be incredible. Uh, per season um, with 21 touchdowns, nine interceptions, and then – 159 rush attempts with 603 yards and eight touchdowns. Um, and again, I named the guys that he's done that with and you can kind of see their production and it's been a little bit all over the place, but usually lots of yards on the ground and lots of touchdowns on the ground. And then about 20, 20 some hundred yards. Um, 
And his QB1 projected this year is Grayson McCall. So most of you guys know Grayson McCall from Coastal Carolina, where he has been pretty consistent, putting up like 25, 26 fantasy points per game over that time. He, uh, you know, his numbers essentially, you know, as far as production, really match what Robert and I has done, right? He's got 2,700 yards um, in 2023. He had 2,800 yards in 2022. Um, and last year he got injured but had 1,900 yards, which was better, you know, per game than those other other two years. He only played about seven games. Um, and then we have him projected at 24.6 fantasy points per game. So, again, I think that's pretty – yeah, I think that's pretty doable for him. We have him at 2,800 yards passing, um, t- 22 touchdowns, and then 350 yards rushing and six touchdowns, which he's had anywhere from 500 yards rushing to um, to 195 while he was a starter. So we're right in that range, and he's had you know about five touchdowns, six touchdowns per year over that span. So again, he's he's right in line with what Robert and I does. Um, and then he's got a receiving core. He's got Kevin Concepcion, um, KC, as he's affectionately called. And he was a baller as a true freshman, right? Kind of played all over the field, even got carries in the backfield. But then they've added in Noah Rogers from Ohio State, who's a former four, five-star from North Carolina. He's he's transitioned back home. And then they also got Wesley Grimes from Wake Forest transferred in. And they have Dakari Collins. So all those guys are coming in. They all have high potential and the reports out of camp are pretty good on those guys. And so this receiving core has so much potential and we'll see if Grayson McCall can unlock it. Um, He's currently going in drafts as the, as the wider, or sorry, the QB 40 and in around 16. So my question for you, based on all that, I just threw a lot of data out at you, Zach, but is Grayson McCall like is he's a guy that you're targeting in drafts? Um, or is this kind of ADP too high for him? So he I have yet to have any shares of him this year in any of our best balls, which um kind of looking through uh some of this play caller stuff, I feel like there's upside here with him. One of the things with him that I think has really fallen off since that freshman year where we all really kind of found Grayson McCall is he had, you know, over 500 yards rushing that year with seven touchdowns on the ground, right? And each year has kind of gotten less and less. Um, I think we know what we get with him on on the passing production, and I think it's really in line with with what we expect in this offense. I think the upside is going to be on that rushing and, and how much they're actually going to use him in in that run game. I don't know if we're going to see him get close to that, you know, um, five, 600 yards for the season. But I think you could kind of see it better than what we've seen the last few years where it just we weren't getting a lot of value there. Um, so I I like where Grayson McCall is going right now. And I actually think it's a, it's a pretty good value because I think. For the most part, you're probably taking him as a QB2 in these drafts, and you've probably locked up a guy you feel really confident in. And if he, you know, the upside in the system, I mean, you've already went over it. I mean, these quarterbacks score points, right? If, and he's he's a guy that fits this system. So I think that the ceiling's there. Um, I don't think I would go a lot higher, even though we haven't projected a little higher than, than QB40. Um I, I like him right at that range. If he's a guy that starts to go a little bit earlier, um, he probably falls off my radar just a little bit. But um, I really like like where he's going right now um, as far as as far as his value. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, he's 15 spots. We have him as a like QB 28, so he's yeah. going about 12 spots lower than that. And I, you know, I I think what Grace McCall is is he's a high floor play, right, with some yeah. up, some serious upside. I think like Robert and I has produced over and over again. And, um, and even last year, right? Like Brandon Armstrong put up 19 points a game and he did that while, you know, he split time in certain games. Right. And then, um, and he just didn't have like, literally Concepcion was the only weapon that he had in an offense. And this offense has a lot better weapons this year. Yeah, I think that's that's a huge. I mean, just what they brought in for that receiver room to add um, 
to what they had last year is a huge lift for this offense. We've talked about it before. I'm really excited to see this offense um, this coming year. I can't wait to see what it looks like. Um, hit, and nice offenses are always fun to watch. I've always enjoyed them. Um, and I just think what they've done with this offense and the pieces that they've brought in, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really fun to watch. And I think it sets some call up for, you know, to have a really good year. Now, if he actually does it, it's yet to be seen, but I, all the pieces are there. You know, I think they, they put, they brought him in and they put good pieces around him um, to really get the job yep. done. And so I, I, yeah, to your point, I love what they, what they brought in this year. Yeah. And you know, I think what last year, what it, this offense had the Billy Kemp role, right. With Concepcion, if we go back to the UVA days, um, but it didn't have, it didn't have right um, the Don Tavian Wicks role, who is the guy that stretches the field. I yeah. mean, but Noah Rogers or Grimes or Collins, you have three guys that could hit that. Um, and then you have like the hybrid tight end ish role um, that I'm blanking on the guy's name, but the former Mississippi State QB that transitioned to wide receiver there at UVA. Um, yeah. uh, anyways. That you know, he was kind of that hybrid tight end ish role that that played a lot of different things, and they have that in Justin Jolly now, and um, and so I, I didn't even mention him, right? And but he's a guy that is a really good tight end, and has a you know really good potential there. So you see the pieces for what Anai wants to do yeah. there in that offense that they had at UVA, um, that he didn't have at Syracuse even quite um, to what he was he was used to. So uh, the way they flipped this this uh, this roster over over the year has been really impressive over this off season. So I'm excited. We'll see, you know, I mean, I should, probably should be a guy that I should draft more. I mean, he's right in that profile, but, um, but so far I think I drafted him twice. Um, and then Bainbridge has drafted him once. And then, you know, every other person has drafted him the 17th round or lower. So, so there we go. All right. Well, let's talk. Oh, real quick. I did want to mention this. They do have, this is getting way too in the weeds, but there is a, the backup QB is Cedric Bailey or CJ Bailey. Um, he is from Chaminade Madonna prep in Miami. If that name doesn't sound familiar to you, that's where Jeremiah Smith went, who is the young receiver at Ohio state and Jojo trader went there as well. He was their quarterback in, in high school. And apparently like he is killing it. Right now at NC State, like they're saying that he's a future star. So in dynasty drafts, um, when those start hitting in May, um, just write down Cedric Bailey and pick him in the sixth, seventh round. Um, and I don't think you'll be disappointed to have the guy that's going to be the QB in this offense for the next couple of years. So, all right, next offense, I'll hand it to you, Zach. We have Major Applewhite at South Alabama. Yeah, head coach. So just promoted. Um, He's been in South Alabama the last three years as the OC. The Major Applewhite's really interesting to me because you can almost break him into two different um, OCs. And one of them is South Alabama the last three years where he really, it was more of a pocket passer. They had um, Jake Bentley, Carter Bradley. Um, they averaged uh, 20 points a game. So there wasn't really a lot of value at that quarterback position. There was nothing in the run game um coming from them um so there just wasn't really a lot and so on the surface it doesn't look like that's that's a system you want to go after the qb but when you go back to major applewhite when he was at houston and two years as oc two years as head coach he had greg ward and derrick king there and you look at those guys and what they did averaging 31 um and a half points a game which is if you just did those seasons um in, in our database he would be a top a top uh play caller for for qbs <laughs> yeah. right so i mean it's just insane what he did and the difference there is i mean greg ward and Derek king right dual threat guy so when major applewhite has that dual threat guy there's a very high ceiling for that quarterback um and that's what gets me excited about applewhite is just the potential in this offense if they can get that style of quarterback um in the system and the other thing um i noticed is so they don't have a quarterback or a, in those three in those four years um they 
they ran for a thousand yards. The quarterback ran for a thousand yards in one year, which you, we don't see very often. Five hundred eighteen and six seventy four, and then double digit touchdowns. Right. So when you go back yeah. to that dual threat, I mean, it's like a true dual threat where they're getting touchdowns. Um, they're throwing Derek King through thirty six touchdowns and ran for fourteen in one year. I don't expect that to happen, but it just shows you that when this offense is is clicking like like um, it can under Apple White, the potential that's there. Um, which leads us to Gio Lopez, which we talked a little bit about um, on the last podcast. And he doesn't have um, a, a ton of experience. Uh, we only have five games with him. He threw for 475 yards last year, four touchdowns, two interceptions. Uh, he did rush for eight, 18 times for 154 yards and two touchdowns. So there's not a ton there with him, but I think it fits a little bit more in that mold of the dual threat guy. Um, than just that straight pocket passer. And so I think that um, with him in that system, we have him at 24.2 points um, as QB 30, which is is probably um, higher than than I expected when I first started these. Um, but he's going as QB 53. So right now, great value on Gio Lopez from, from where the projections are. And again, it's really driven by um, the fact that when Major Applewhite has a dual threat quarterback, those guys um, are really solid in, in CFF. So um, the other thing he has, uh, a guy that's getting drafted pretty high, Jamal Pritchett, right, that that receiver. So he has him coming back. He has Devin Voison coming back, DJ Thomas at tight end. So he still has some of those weapons um, in the passing game. And I – there's a lot of debate right now on on uh, running back. Who's going to be the running back on this team? Is it going to be Kentrell Bullock or, or McReynolds? And um, part of me is like, maybe it's not going to matter too much if Gio Lopez is is running that ball more, right? So when when Major Applewhite's having um, a quarterback that runs the ball, we we see that production just drop off at the running back position. So that's so true. If, if we're expecting Gio Lopez to to be that dual threat guy, um, I don't think we should expect to see that South Alabama running back that we've seen the last few years when they had that more of a pocket passer. Um, the other thing too that I really like about this offense um, for Gio is they got four starters back on the offensive line, mm, so yeah. um, that can be that can be really big for for this offense. So a lot of things. Um, get me excited about about what could be um like i mentioned uh gio lopez is going right around 44 the 44th quarterback um round 17 that's such good value for for where you're getting him i mean you probably already have three or four qbs by the time you get there so you're taking this guy as a qb5 and i mean it, he's he might not put it all together in one year but he's gonna have some big games um if if it, if it all pans out. Um, but two things I have for you, Josh. Yeah. Um, one, what kind of usage do you think we're going to get from him in the run game, right? Those Greg Ward and Derek King ran the ball a lot. I mean, Greg Ward yeah. had almost 200 rushing attempts in both seasons there, right? So that's a yeah. lot. That's a lot of attempts. And the other thing that's not so much quarterback related, but the slot guy in this offense um, is a guy that back when they had at Houston, they used the slot more than the outside. Whereas um, the first two years at South Alabama, they really targeted the outside guy more. Last year was more of the, the slot with Lacey. Um, but do, do we even have sort of a, I feel like we know the outside guys, right? With mm -hmm. Pritchett and then, do we do you have a good sense of maybe the slot guy to target? Um, because there isn't really anybody else getting drafted receiver wise. So what do yeah. you think there? Yeah, I mean, I don't really know other than maybe Jamal Pritchett goes inside more um and runs inside uh, you know, in the slot more. But you know, I don't know what we I don't know what his splits were. Maybe you can look that up while I'm talking. But it, it's interesting with Geo, what the difference between Geo and Ward and King is both of those guys, right? They were so such dynamic athletes that they were wide receivers before they were right. quarterbacks. Um, 
And both of them, you know, wide receiver uh, or Greg Ward went on to play wide receiver in the NFL. I mean, that's how dynamic he is of an athlete. Gio Lopez isn't that he's more of a true quarterback. And when I, you know, because we had limited tape on him last year, I went back and watched his high school film and man, like he definitely is a pass first guy. I was a little shocked that he ran seven, he had seven carries for 88 yards in the bowl game, but he's decisive, man. Like I, it, it just really stuck out to me how much he went through his progressions and he went through them quickly, but then he made the pass. Like he was very decisive with the passes he made. And so I, I'm I'm curious. I think he's gonna throw. I think he's gonna be a lot better quarterback or thrower than Greg Ward and Derek King were in college. Um, and so I I could see him more in the you know 400 yard range with maybe eight touchdowns um, rushing because I just don't think he's gonna want to run the ball that much. I mean I think he's gonna want to distribute. Um, if his guys aren't open, I could see him pulling it down and running it. But his decision making, like the quickness that he processes, is just it, it's really, really good. Um, especially for a guy at that level. He's also a guy that uh, Major Applewhite actually handpicked, right? Instead of getting, you know, got Carter Bradley as a you know, a guy that came in from Toledo. Um, and it wasn't really maybe his guy. Um, and now he's got he's got his guy. So I'm curious, man. I, I see the upside, but what about Pritchett? Did he just run all outside last year? No, he was um, – he ran about 300 to 100, 300 outside and 100. So yeah. Inside the slot. So, so I, I just wonder – Same with is- – sorry, same with voice and two. So both of those guys did um, mostly outside, but they still did about a third of their routes on the in, – or at, in the slot, so – yeah, I mean, because like, I guess the thing with me with Pritchett too is like, he's 5'8, 164. Yeah. So, you know, if he's running outside, he's running, he's a Z, right? So he's not lining up on the line of scrimmage. Um, so why not just put him in the slot and let him, let him run free there? I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess he seems like he's a good enough route runner too to be able to do it. So to me, it seems like it's a natural fit for Pritchett to, to go inside. Um, so, but that, that's just what I think. I mean, he wasn't going to get inside with Colin Lacey. <laughs> that's right. For sure. Right. So, um, but he, I definitely think he could without Colin Lacey there. So that, that would be my answer that I think they ultimately moved Pritchett inside. Um, uh, but I could be wrong there. I haven't, I haven't looked it up enough. So we need to wait for the G five hide guys to, to yeah. do their podcast on that. <laughs> um, cool. Anything else? That's all I got. All right. That's good, man. Yeah. Gio, Gio Lopez. Um, yeah. I like him a lot. So, all right. Jeff Lebby at Mississippi state. Um, he's our next guy. And this is a guy, man. He has, he's another one that just had dual threat quarterback after dual threat quarterback over the last six years. So 2017, he was at um, Southeastern uh, university, which is actually, uh, it's like a, I don't even know. NAIA. Um, what they are though, is that's where my parents went to school. <laughs> it's a very small, like Christian school. Um, and so you have that school to thank for me in the world. Uh, so there we are. Uh, but that's, that's all we'll talk about Southeastern. Um, but UCF and Mississippi was where he was at after that. And then he was at Oklahoma. So he had Matt Corral, right. And then he had Dylan Gabriel, um, both last year and then when he was at, at UCF or the last two years at Oklahoma and at UCF. So, um, and he used, you know, his first year in 2019, um, when, when he was with Josh, I think it was with Josh Hypo at that point. Um, he didn't use Gabriel in the rushing game at all, really. But then after that, he hasn't had it, you know, whether it's Gabriel or Corral, that Corral had two years of 500 yards rushing and then, um, you know, with Gabriel, he had 300 yards the last couple of years. Um, and then he had double digit touchdowns with once with Corral and once with Gabriel. So um, this year he's got, oh yeah. Um, on average, the passing numbers are 2,800 yards, 25 touchdowns and eight interceptions. And then 93 rushes and 316 rushing yards and then seven touchdowns. So Blake Shapin is the projected RB or QB one. 
there. Um, and we have him at QB 55 in our projections, 22.6 fantasy points per game. We have him right around 3,000 yards passing, 24 touchdowns, and then 180 yards rushing and three touchdowns. Um, and I don't know how familiar people are with Shapin. He had 24, uh, you know, around 24 fantasy points last year um, at Baylor with Jeff Grimes as an OC. Um, played in only eight games, but had 2,100 yards passing, 273 yards per game, um, and then 13 touchdowns, three interceptions. So he had a pretty decent year. Um, considering he didn't play the whole year. Um, and this is a guy that both like me and Wes Huber, um, you know, one of my main mentors in this space, we were very high on him early on. Um, and, I, you know, he's a guy that really took the job from Jerry Bohannon back in the day um, and, you know, sent him to USF. Um, and so I like Shapin as a passer. I actually think he could be a really good fit um, with Jeff Lebby. And, you know, I think he's got, you know, he's got Kelly um, Akarari. I don't really probably butchered that name, but that's, he's the old UTEP wide receiver, right? That was a pretty much a go route wide receiver. And then they got Kevin Coleman, who um, was at Jackson state with Deion Sanders for a year. And then he went to Louisville and did okay this last year as a sophomore. Um, and he's coming over and he's going to play the slot role. Um, Kelly will be outside and we have them really projected both at 800 yards receiving. And so pretty similar in their production. Um, although Kevin Coleman's pretty much going undrafted, which is interesting. Um, and um, and so anyways, Shapin's going as in round 27. Pretty much the only reason he's going round 27 is, I think, me. Um, I don't even know who else is drafting him. Um I guess Mike Bainbridge drafted him twice and then I drafted him. Um, and then a few other randoms, That's but about it. yeah. So um, we're the only guys that are really on him, but um, that's cause I, I, you know, again, I like Blake Shapin. He is, it's like, whatever he's QB 68 um, in the ADP right now. And so we have projected at QB 55. So Lots of question marks probably at Mississippi State, but what what do you think? You know, are are Mike and I crazy for even drafting him at all? No, you know, I, like when you look at, at what you, we've gotten out of um, Jeff Levy's QBs, it it would be crazy to think that we're taking a guy at the end of a draft, right? Because of what we've seen, um, I actually really really like. Um, taking him at the end of the draft because at that point you're just kind of taking shots in the dark anyways I think on a lot of these guys especially in some of these drafts where we're at 30 35 rounds and um, quarterback typically um, is the most accurate at, when it comes to projections um, but there's also usually the biggest misses meaning we don't have guys that that we haven't projected way too low and, and they outperform their projection as well. And Shapin's one of those guys, I don't think he's going to be a, a top 12 guy at the end of the year, but I think he's going to give you some really good games. So I love where you guys take him at the end of a draft. I, I haven't taken him yet. I wouldn't take him anywhere outside of probably the top 25, right? I mean, he, right. he's, he's right. an end of a draft guy for sure. But to all the points you just mentioned, I mean, there's there's just some upside here that that you're going to get with him um, in these drafts. I'll be really interested to see, too. I feel like he has um, some good weapons in the past game, but not I, I still like I'm I'm really interested to see how that really pans out, because I feel like it, it could be better than even we're thinking right now, just with, with some of the pieces that they have. Um, but I also know too, um, it's that that program is just kind of, I mean, it's the, the third coach in, in like three years. Right. So, um, yeah. I feel like we need to, you almost need to give them kind of that year to, to kind of get going. And, um, I don't know if we'll really see that full potential or even close to close to that potential hitting this year. So I think, everybody on this team is is still a bit risky but 25 rounds you know after the 25th round i that's i like that value a lot 
Yeah, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I mean, he's a guy. It is definitely risky. I mean, you're talking about Jeff Levy, right? He's always coming into a really good system, right? Yeah. He, you know, at Ole Miss, he was – I'm pretty sure – I could be wrong, but yeah, no, he was, he's with Lane Kiffin there. Um, and then, you know, he's with, you know, he basically has the full range of Oklahoma, who's the, the cupboard is never bare at wide receiver, right? He brings his guy over from UCF. UCF he is with Josh Heupel. We know what he does. So, I mean, he's always had talent. So this is the first time he's really having to build it up himself. Yeah. Um, and so we'll see, right. We'll see what he can do with, with what he's got. So, um, yeah, you know, taking shots at the end of drafts, but yeah, if he starts, you know, creeping up and like people start hyping him up, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out on that too, for sure. But the other thing is like, he's not, there's no QB battle. So there's others that we're going to talk about here that there's a QB battle. And so it's like, you got to take both of them. And so now you're wasting a roster spot ultimately. And I don't, I don't love that. So you don't have to do that with Blake Shapin here at the end of drafts. So, yep. All right, Eric Morris is next, and I'll let you take it over from here. Yeah, Eric Morris, North Texas. So um, this is this is another interesting one. We we had Eric Morris spend some time at Texas Tech with um, uh, Mike Leach and Cliff Kingsbury. So it kind of comes from from that whole air raid type tree. He had when you look at what he had at Texas Tech with um, Davis Webb and and Pat Mahomes, um, those guys put up a lot of points, right? Mahomes in his two seasons there um, with with Morris there he was averaging thirty nine points a game which is just insane. Um, he went on to Incarnate Word uh, where they a lot more just pocket passer there. Um, they they didn't have that quarterback run the ball much. Um, Cam Ward came came from Incarnate Word um, followed him up to Washington State so um, that was one reason why I think. Um, when when Cam Ward transferred to Washington State, everybody was or a lot of people were really on that hype train with um, that offense going to Washington State. Uh, Cam Ward coming with his his head coach, right, was going to be the OC there. He knew the system, um, and he he didn't have that great of a year. And that was actually when you look at at really the last ten years of what Eric Morris has done. That twenty two season at Washington State was his worst um, for quarterback play at twenty one. 21 points a game, but moving on to North Texas last year with Chandler Rogers, he got it back up to 26.8. So, I mean, he averages over 10 years, 29.6 points a game. So wow. um, he, he, he did it at, at FCS. Some of that's at FCS. Um, and then um, at Texas Tech, Washington State, North Texas, right? So just really solid. Um, not This is one of the rare – uh, mostly pocket passer though. You're not, you're not, there hasn't been a ton of rushing production come from his quarterbacks. Mahomes did, um, had, he had two seasons where he had double digit rushing touchdowns. Um, yeah. I don't think we expect that really in this system outside of when you have that type of type of an, a quarterback, um, at, you know, in your system, but, uh, Overall, his quarterbacks will generally get a couple touchdowns, um, and but not a, not a ton of rushing yards. I think last year, the thing I really like when you look at what um, he does is he fits his offense to to his personnel. Right, Chandler Rogers not not great, but he he got a little bit of rushing production um, uh, in in that offense. And I think with our projected QB one Chandler Morris this year, I think you can see something a little bit similar. I don't think you're going to see a, t a ton of rushing production, but there could be a little bit of upside there. But um, th this offense is just um, they're going to throw the ball, and and they brought in Chandler Morris to come in and run this system. Um, he he's very interesting to me because um, at TCU. He was a guy that uh, two years ago, he actually won that starting job over Duggan. And I remember I, I got him in the CFF league and I was so excited because I'm like, this is, you want this guy, you want this quarterback in the system. And he just did not look that good uh, to start the year. And I think he got hurt and eventually lost that job and never got it back. And then it was yeah. almost the same thing last year. I'm like, here we go. It's the redemption season. And he just never, it just never really felt like it clicked with him. Um, so this is uh, year three of me um, <laughs> looking at Chandler Morris and thinking, hey, maybe maybe it's going to click. He's dropping down a level, right? So 
um, even though I don't think it's it's a huge drop, but it, it is a drop from going from the Big 12 down, um, which could help. Uh, again, it's a proven system with QBs. Um, they throw a lot of touchdowns in the system. I mean, they average 30 touchdowns a, a season, right, at passing touchdowns a season. So yeah. um, that's always pretty solid there. Um, so it's it's one of those uh, Chandler Morris uh, comes in and and – can he get it done? The other thing, and I could be wrong on this, Josh, but I don't think he has joined the team yet. Um, I think he has announced that he's going there, but he's actually not there for spring ball, which is also another little bit, bit of hesitation for me um, when when you're looking at how, how well he'll perform. The positive side, he's got um, some solid receivers, I think, Damon Ward and um, Landon Sides both back from last year's team who I thought did pretty well sides is in the slot Ward was, was on the outside. So they have two of those guys. He has DT Sheffield coming in from Washington state, which is interesting to me because he ended up leaving the team. I don't know if there was overlap with, um, with Morris at Washington state and Sheffield. Um, Yeah. I don't think so. He's, he's a guy that could come in and and run that slot there. Um, They have, Ragsdale back at running back. Um, Trey Bradford transferred from LSU at running back. So that they did bring in, in a piece there. And then um, the other thing, this isn't this isn't great for him, but there's only two returning starters on the outline. So um, it this one, it just feels like there's a lot up in the air with it, with him not being there yet this spring. Um, but he's he's going um, around round 10 and usually at – the 25th QB. So he's, um, and, and I will say, I, I want Josh to not take him in the next few drafts. Cause I want to see where his value actually would be, because I think Josh has taken, taken Chandler Morris nine times. So I think he's yeah. driving that, driving that, uh, ADP there. Um, but he's really going in that 10th, 11th round. Um, which is lower than where we have him ranked projected 12th, which I think is a pretty high close, closer to that ceiling than um, for his projection. And he's going about 25th, 26th QB. So I really like the value there. Um, But like I said, Josh is drafting him a lot. So I don't know what, what everybody else, what everybody else thinks of him. So it's good value, but there definitely is some risk right now with, with, one, the his historical performance hasn't been great, and he's not not with the team yet. I don't believe. Um, so Dude, Josh, those, are, those are great points. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess just with with you taking him so much, obviously you love the value with where it's at. But, yeah. Um, you just want to kind of talk about your like why you're drafting and why you're targeting him so much. Yeah. So I have him nine times. You have him twice in Bainbridge. Yeah. And then it's get Lex Mill, who's Tom Topia, who's like one of our, you know, he's on staff yeah. with us actually at Fantasy Points. He's writing for us this next year. Um, and he's so sharp, right? He identifies ta- talent. And so part of why I've taken him is like, man, like I, I trust your our projections, right? Um, I trust Tom Topia. I like Chandler Morris, right? He's stepping down a level. I mean, all Eric Morris. I mean, all these boxes get checked. Um, but the points you bring up of like, I didn't even... I guess I just assumed he was on campus um, because it is hard to get North Texas news. And I don't think he is. I think you're right. Um, And so I guess the ultimate question is like, if for some reason he doesn't show up, then man, that's a lot of risk there that I'm, I'm taking on if he doesn't show up. Um, And, but if he does and he's the guy, I mean, look, Chandler Rogers was like, okay. At Louisiana Monroe wasn't great. Um, and so we've seen him do it with one Chandler at North Texas. Maybe you can do it with another Chandler here. Um, so I, the, the upside's so high, but man, like, yeah, we need we need some confirmation that he is actually going to step on campus uh, because if not, then we could be in trouble. The other thing is that, yeah, DT Sheffield, I don't see how that guy doesn't make an impact. That guy is yeah. so talented, but we'll see. I actually forgot he he was even going to be there until I was kind of looking at some stuff over the last few days because we had Ward and Sides are our top two guys, right? And um, that's kind of where I'd focus. And then I'm like, oh, DT Sheffield's there. I mean, this like that could be that 
So that can make it interesting in that that receiver room. And, and yes, and I will say, Zach, like although they didn't overlap, um, I'm like Eric Morris had to be the one that recruited DT Sheffield there because he didn't take that job until I don't think until after the North Texas job until after the early signing period um, last year. So he was the one that recruited him, which is why he probably ended up at North Texas. And look, like that dude was balling out. I mean, whatever, he didn't work out, but he balled out in spring ball and up in camps. And um, so he's got the talent. We'll just see if he can keep it together. And look, North Texas has had some dynamic wide receivers over the years. And the AC, AAC um, yeah. is a lot like the ACC and is defensively challenged. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of potential here. That's good. All right, anything else? That's all I got with him. All right. All right, next up, I got to scroll back up and uh, get to my guy. Um, we have Mike Shanahan. Right, so he is the Indiana OC. He followed Kurt Signetti there. They were both at JMU together. Um, fun fact about Mike Shanahan: he hasn't really been an OC for that long. Really, like he was a passing game coordinator for JMU from 2019 to 2021, um, but he didn't really take over um, as the OC until 2022. Now, there's so there's limited sample size here, but um, and I don't want to I don't want to go too deep here, but. The work he did was incredible. Um, like he had Todd, Todd Santeo, who I believe was at Temple, and then he went to Colorado State, and people are like, all right, this guy's awful. Um, and I think you – yeah, anyways, I won't say who's with. But then he comes to JMU, and my man puts up 30 uh, – no, 2,600 yards passing, which nothing to write home about, 398 yards rushing – and then he has six touchdowns, but he only, I mean, he played in 10 games, right? So he didn't, that's not a full season's work. He got hurt. He averaged 31.2 fantasy points per game. And this is a guy that did nothing in his first four or five years in college football. Um, and then he takes Jordan McLeod, who basically starts as a freshman at USF in like 2019, maybe 2020, and then does nothing, right? He goes to Arizona. He flames out and basically just sits on a bench for a couple of years. He goes to JMU and this guy puts up 3,600 yards passing, which passing was not his strong suit. <laughs> um, and then he rushes for 285 yards and he has eight touchdowns. And so we're not even talking about like crazy production in the, in the running game, but you know, both these guys were dual threats and he, um, you know, puts up 30 fantasy points per game. So if you just took the last couple of years um, where he's actually been the OC and not just the passing game coordinator. Um, yeah. He would, he would rank number three in fantasy points per game. So he's done incredible work. His projected QB one at Indiana is Curtis Rourke. Um, we have him projected at 21.9 fantasy points per game. So that's QB 66. Um, we have him at 2,500 yards passing, 21 pass TDs, and 300 yards rushing on five TDs. So right around um, the average, right, of what we've seen with rushing yards and then, I know, a little below what we've seen. Because, look, I'm, I'm sure Mike Shanahan, he's a genius, but he's moving up to the Big Ten. And, um, and you know, he's got some of the same – he's got um, Elijah Surratt that's going with him, right? You got Donovan McCauley, who's okay. Um, they have EJ Williams from back in the day <laughs> with Clemson, right? Like he's still there. Um, so he's a target on the outside. And then you have um, Keyshawn Williams, who was a wake for a slot, who I really liked and thought he should have gotten more burn there. Um, he's actually a guy that could be sneaky good um, to me because he's a, he's a slot wide receiver. And JMU has featured – or Mike Shanahan ha has featured a slot receiver before – um, so anyways, he's got some potential there in the passing game. Um, but man, Curtis Rourke, he's going ADP. He's going 26, right? So really late QB 68. Um, so right around where we have him projected. Um, so he's a late, late pick. Um, and this is a guy a couple of years ago who put up some like great stats, right? At Ohio before he tore his ACL. Um, you know, he put up. 
3,200 yards passing in 11 games before he tore his ACL that year, had 25 touchdowns. Um, and then he ran for 249 yards. Um, he was not quite as good last year. I'm not really sure why. He just looked, he just, I don't know, that whole offense kind of looked out of, they looked funky, right? Like they're out of rhythm. I don't know. Um, but he didn't look the same. Uh, but Kurt Signetti, man, I mean, he, they handpicked Curtis Rourke to be their QB. I mean, they could have had Jordan McLeod um, at the, you know, at the G5 level move up. They could have had other guys and they chose to go with Curtis Rourke. So maybe they see something that, you know, we don't, maybe they see that they can revive some things. I mean, I think Curtis Rourke has potential, but yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts here? Is this going to be a year zero and like, this is going to be not good. What, what, yeah. What thoughts? This I, so I've avoided everybody on this team, not because yeah. I don't believe in this staff, but I mean, one thing that you see when guys make that jump up um, from a G five to uh, the power five, especially the big 10 and the sec uh, that performance is just not there. Um, yeah. and I think you're seeing, they brought in some guys that came from, um, you know, the, the G five, that, that smaller, and it's just a big jump for a guy like Rourke, um, Surratt, right. So not that these guys don't have the talent. I just think year one new system for some of these guys in the big 10, um, I don't, and Indiana was not good last year right like they just there just was not it i just don't see this year being good um really at all he's a guy that um if you take him if you take him it's got to be one of the last few rounds i think um in a draft i probably won't have any of him um maybe you know get him a last round of a draft but i just i don't I think you're right. It's a year zero. I, I just think there's, I think the staff is good, um, but yeah. it's just such a different level of competition um, that they're going to be up against. And I just don't, like you mentioned, Rourke, he just, um, last year, it just didn't click, um, which was interesting because I, I, I was really expecting a big year from him. Um, I think everybody was, and it just never um, really came to fruition. And I just, I, you know, I don't, I, I just don't see that clicking now when you're facing, yeah. you know, big right. ten defenses. So, right, San Diego State was giving you fits, and now you got to go right. up against Ohio State, Penn State, whatever. So, yeah, yeah, it's a big jump. It's a big jump. Yeah, he's a guy. I mean, of all these guys on this list, he's probably, even though, you know, I want to root for Kirk Signetti and Mike Shanahan. I mean, it's just going to be Elijah Surratt has started yeah. to drop like a yeah. lot. And um, if he's going to drop double digit rounds, then I'll, I'll take some shots on him late. I think I got him in the 17th round. Um, but other than that, like I'm, I'm pretty out on this, this offense. Yeah. Even uh, so uh, Sarah and even McCauley, I might take late just a flyer on a, on a receiver there, but I don't think just looking at what they have, there's no, I mean, there's nobody else on this team right now that I I'd even be taking. Right. Yeah, totally. Totally. All right. We're going to wrap these. uh, We have a couple more left here. Um, Yeah. So you got uh, Sean Lewis here, right? Sean Lewis. Yeah. So this one's interesting. He's now at San Diego state. So um, he spent a couple years with Dino Babers, right? At Bowling Green, Syracuse. We kind of saw what that, that offense could do. That system could do. Um, but I feel like we really saw um, Sean Lewis when he went to to Kent State, and they had that the flash fast offense, right? So yeah. this is a team that um, they run a lot of plays, right? They were averaging like seventy seven plays per game. They had a couple years back, like eight years ago, where they were up over eighty plays a game. So I mean. This is this is a an, an offense that he wants to move that ball fast. They spread the they spread the field out right wide. Um, they got their receivers w- way out wide. They run a lot of RPO right. They they use that in their run game, and you really see that with the quarterback play right. So the quarterback um, 
generally takes quite a few carries um, in rushing attempts in this offense with that with that RPO offense. Um, so you're really going to see that um, the dual threat quarterback is it is best in this offense. And when you look at it, um, it's just at Kent State because I feel like that's really his offense, right? That's that's the best representation yeah. we have. Um, that quarterback averaged 26 points a game, um, but when they had Woody Barrett, Dustin Crum, and Colin Schley there, right? Woody Barrett, um, that was that first year. He he um, wasn't great. He <laughs> only averaged 20, he averaged 20 points a game. But when Dustin Crum um, got that job in 2019, um, that's when we really saw that offense thrive. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even when Colin Schley took over, we saw that really kind of drop at that quarterback position where he was just averaging 20 points a game. The yeah. interesting thing about this offense, the quarterback's going to run the ball, right? They're going to, they're probably going to have four or 500 rushing yards um, on the season. They should have roughly six, seven touchdowns. Um, the biggest difference between a good quarterback in the system and a very average quarterback when you're looking at it is passing touchdowns, right? Do they have do they have the passing game to make this quarterback valuable? He's gonna get some of some of his um he's gonna get that rushing production, four or five hundred rushing yards, right? But the the seasons where with Dustin Crum when they could they could pass that ball and they had those receivers that can make plays and those big explosive plays, that's really what it comes down to. That's when this offense offense really gets rolling. Um, so we have AJ Duffy from from Florida State, which is which is an it, it's interesting. He limited time at, at Florida State, right? We never really saw um, much of what he could do. Uh, he but he is a guy that fits this mold. Um, he did he ran for 817 yards in high school, so he can he can run. He's a dual threat guy. Um, he can he can throw. Uh, the ball a little bit, or at least he could in high school. So we'll, we'll I think he's he's going to be able to come in and run this system with with how um, they want. Um, but again, it always gives me pause. First first year in the system, um, he's new to the system, so we'll see what what he can do. We have him projected at 19 points per game right now, which is quarterback 93, which is it's is pretty low. Um, and the big the big reason why is just because we don't have that passing production um, bumped up right now. So um, that could change. Um, but again, a lot of this a lot of this value is going to rely on that passing production. They'll have the he'll have the rushing production. Um, I think the other piece to this, and I kind of alluded to it already, but just the receiver play, right? And and what are we going to get from those receivers? When you go back to that Kent State team, they had some really dynamic receivers that could go out and make plays. He has Mekki Shaw, who, um, you know, he's he's all right. Uh, Deshaun Polk comes over from Kent State. Yeah. Um, so that could be interesting. I'm excited about that one. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they have some running backs, which uh, Armstead, Cam Davis, Lucky Sutton, right? A lot of those guys returning and only one returning starter on the O-line. So mm. um, this is one of those offenses where I just feel like, uh, I don't know what we're going to get yet. I, I, I'm not too optimistic with it. Um, like I said, I think Duffy fits, fits what he wants in a quarterback. Um, it is a step down for Duffy too, right? Going from, from Florida state to, to San Diego state. But again, year one new offense. And when you look at San Diego state and where they've been traditionally, this is a big change for this offense. Um, and so I think it's going to be really trying to find the pieces, and it's probably going to take a little bit more than than just year one to to really get rolling with this offense. I would expect we see something closer to his 2018 Kent State season with with Woody Barrett. Not that AJ Duffy is Woody Barrett, but just kind of the similar um, similar projection there um, yeah. for, for what we have um, with this. And then again, his ADP. He's going around 26. He's actually only been drafted five times, so he's not being drafted really at all, just a yeah. couple times. Um, and so you can pretty much get him um, in any draft and get him late, which which I like. Um, but my question, Josh, you know, is 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 AJ Duffy going to be more like uh, Crum or 
<laughs> Woody Barrett? And do they have the receivers to get this passing game going? Yeah. I mean, they also have Lewis Brown coming in from Colorado State, who was yep. decent last year. I mean, yep. he had some games. Um, yeah, I think I think year one is going to be tough. Oh, the other thing is they might have Marquez Cooper coming in, um, who's an old Kent State running back, Ball State guy. Yeah. Um, and, and so – go ahead. Good point there because – Actually, Colin Schley, one reason why his production really yep. dropped is because of Cooper. <laughs> so, again, that's something to pay attention to. If Cooper does come in, that's just going to take away from from that quarterback production. Well, and it's like, what have they done for the last 15 years at San Diego right. State? It's like run the ball. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I think A.J. Duffy is the type that I would say, hey, stash him in Dynasty right? Like get them at the end of your drafts or, you know, if you can get value for them, get them in dynasty. Um, I think year two might be better than year one. I mean, I, I, this guy was at IMG Academy in, yeah. in Florida for his last year. So he is no slouch. I mean, he played in the Under Armour All-American game. I mean, this is a guy, he just didn't have the talent to play at Florida State and that's okay. Like there's a lot of guys that don't have that, but can he play at San Diego State? Um, well, I think he's that he's a lot more likely to, to succeed there. So I think he succeeds, but maybe not year one. Does that make sense? Yeah. One, so, sorry, you just made me think of this. Uh, they Correct me if I'm wrong, but Danny O'Neill, true freshman QB, came in too, and I think they're pretty high on him. He's a guy that had offers from um, Colorado, where, where um, Lewis was at before, Syracuse, Purdue, Louisville, right? So some yeah. – um, bigger schools and so just when you talk about a kind of a dynasty stash he's a guy too that yeah that i've i've kind of check marked he ran for um 1300 yards his um or 700 wow. yards his his senior year 1300 okay. total so in over two years um so he does have that rushing production um that i think really fits what he wants to do he threw for 98 touchdowns in high school so yeah. i mean he's a guy that you know coming in he was he's a three star guy, but had some some bigger offers, and now he's at San Diego State, and just feels like he could fit this this offense too. Yeah, I think that's a great point by you too, though. Of like, it's going to take time to transition, yeah. and so like Dy- Dynasty is maybe more we should look because it will be successful. It's just yeah. about when when is it successful, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so. Yeah, so that is San Diego State. We are going to transition now to our last one, and that's Washington State with Ben Arbuckle. He is the OC there at Washington State with the Cougars. And, man, he's had Cam Ward um, last year. Like before that, he was over at Western Kentucky, um, and he had um, uh, Austin Reed. Reed. That's right, Austin Reed, who averaged 32.6 points per game. Cam Ward came in. Um, last year and he had 28.5 um, and look Austin Reed I think he 4,700 yards passing 40 touchdowns and then um, and then Cam Ward had 3,700 and, and then 25 both of them had eight eight rushing touchdowns which is really interesting when they got around the goal line he used them and now there's an you know there are new QBs in town right like the, you have John Mateer who's the um, the backup there um, last year, he came in and ran some Wildcat. And you have Zevi Eckhaus. And Zevi Eckhaus is a transfer, an FCS transfer like Cam Ward. He's from Bryant. He was up for some top awards at the FCS level. He threw for 8,000 yards at that level. Um, and he was really successful. And, um, and Ben Arbuckle's bringing him in. I mean, Austin Reed was from the Division II level. And he's at Western Kentucky. Right. And so, but Washington state is not in the PAC 12 anymore. Right. And so they're going to play quite a bit of Mount, mountain West teams. So we're not talking about crazy competition that they're going to have to play um, the way that Cam Ward had to play back in the day. So they're not quite moving up two levels. Um, but, you know, where I think most people in the industry that I've at least heard talk about this, they're going after John Mateer. Um, we're more on Zevi Eckhouse. And it's, it's, and look, we're not like crazy slants in one way or the other. We, we just think, and um, probably a lot driven by me that Zevi, they probably brought him in for a reason. Um, but head coach um, has said that this is going to go up until possibly the first game. So if you take one, you got to take the other. Um, 
both were actually rated very similarly in high school, um, you know, coming out. And so although Matir got there right out of high school, um, Zevi was just as, you know, as far as from a scout's perspective, he was just as talented. Um, and you watch his tape and, and Eckhouse is very fun to watch. Um, and so our projection though is 25.5 fantasy points per game. It's QB 21 forever wins this job. Both of these guys are going in round 23 or 24 for John Matier and then round 26 or 27 for Zevi Eckhaus. And who's drafting those guys? It's you. You and me. I, uh, probably, so probably the problem me. is I want to draft them. I just can't get them before Josh does. He beats me through every draft, every single so, draft. Yeah, and so look, man, okay. Um, fun fact, I think I, I don't have the number off the off, you know, I'm doing this off my dome, but I think they threw the ball like 60 plus percent of the time last year at Washington State. If I'm not mistaken, maybe it wasn't that high, but it was like some absurd number. Six sixty percent. Yeah. So 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 that's crazy. I mean, a lot of times I, you know, usually you see like 55, 45 would be a high split for passing. Um, but there's 60, 40. I mean, that's a pretty you know, pretty high split um, in my, you know, in my mind. Um, and so they're going to throw the rock around. And if they do that, like they're going to, they're going to get yards. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on drafting these guys late? Yeah, I love, I love it. I mean, I know you kind of mentioned it before. You, you have to sp- spend two roster spots on these guys right now, just because we don't know. But um, the way I look at it is um, you're, you're going to get, uh, a QB in a system that's going to throw the ball and it's they're going to score points. Um, the other thing you touched on that I really love about this this team for this year is the schedule, right? This the schedule is a lot easier. It's actually one of the when we were looking at it, one of the easiest schedules compared to last year that that any Power Five team is going to have. It actually is the easiest. Um, and so I really love that where they still have on that team some of those high caliber athletes, right? Some guys that, that can really play at, at a higher level. And they're going to yeah. be going against a lot of these these smaller schools. And I just think with some of the weapons that they're going to have, I mean, Kyle Williams had a really good year last year. Um, we're kind of going trying to decide between uh, Hudson and Hernandez in the slot, right? But we feel pretty good about what, what those two guys can bring. So – Yep. It all comes down to the passing game. And I think that they have the pieces, they have a, the matchups, um, which are two, the two things I really look at the most um, are going to be what's, what's the system and what are your matchups? And both are heavily in favor of either one of these guys. And you, I, I, like I said, taking them, Josh beats me in every draft to these guys. I don't have very many shares at all. Um, I wouldn't get too crazy yet with, with where you're taking them. Um, you don't want right. to, you know, you don't right. want to, but um, as, as we start to hear more and maybe start to lean towards, they start to lean towards one of these guys or it's going to, we get a good feel with that might change. But right now I love taking both of these guys in late in drafts. Yeah. I mean, the highest I've gone is round 23, um, but I'm usually going 28, 29, 25. Um, with Zevi and then um, John Matier, you know, you got to go up a little bit for him because there's yeah. guys that will draft him, but never above. Still, I'll, I'll never go r- above round 20. Yeah, you're still in the 20s, which I mean, you're possibly getting a top five QB in round 25. So, yeah, I mean, it's just like, yeah, so just taking that shot. I mean, these are the types of guys that, um, yeah, you take shots on and you just see like the Gio Lopez is the world. I mean, the guys that are in good systems. We did this with Byron Brown last year, right? Um, before Jerry Bohan and there was some mix up there about whether he was going to be in the mix. But like we still, we took them late and, you know, Byron Brown is now a, a first round QB, a top three lock. Um, and you're getting them in round 17 to 25 last year. So um, you want to target the guys in these types of systems because they're not all going to hit, right? But they're, we're talking about most of these guys we mentioned tonight are around 15 plus. And again, even more of them are around 25 plus. They're not even on most people's radar. But 
Um, these are the type of guys that can potentially win you leagues. And when you talk about for some of us where we're not drafting QBs till eighth and ninth round, it's because, yeah, we're going to wait till round 20s to pick up our four through six, seven QBs. Um, and um, and so this is these are the strategies that we're taking um, to to try to win our best ball leagues um, this year. So any kind of final thoughts on this before we we get out of here? I think you touched on most of it again, you know, just wanted to highlight some of these guys in these systems that have really produced over the years that you can get late in these drafts. And, and hopefully some of these guys are going to hit. I feel pretty good about most of these guys, at least year one, or like we've kind of talked about two dynasty uh, could be some dynasty plays in here as well. So. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. So this is fun, man. I appreciate how you doing this with me and oh, uh, yeah. we'll have our boys back next week after they have, fully recovered from the bachelor party, Mike and Froton. And um, yeah, it'll be a fun, fun time. A couple of promotions before we get out of here, uh, man, over at fantasy points, Zach and I, we basically run the show over there and um, we have a bunch of stuff on the site that we've been putting out over the last couple of weeks to get ready for this push, this run. And one is free ADP. So we have ADP from 20 plus drafts. Um, and we are 20 and counting, right? right? There's been several drafts already, but we put that out on the site um, and it goes by position. It goes by, um, you know, overall ADP as well. Um, and uh, we, we want to help grow CFF. And one of the things that's really intimidating is that there's not ADP out there. And so we want to help you guys with that um, and help people um, drafting. So, um, so yeah, so that's one thing. Um, second thing, we just put out our projections this week. And so we um, were really excited about our projections. We think they're going to be really helpful for you. Um, and so you can get those on our site. Uh, and then we also have rankings that will be coming out very soon. Um, hopefully by either the end of this month or very beginning of April, we'll start cranking them out. Um, and we have an early bird special that will be ending on Easter. So March 31st. Um, be the last that you can get it on our college football subscription package. And it's usually 150 bucks right now. It's 20% off at 120. And so, man, sign up, join our discord. It's awesome. We're going to do DFS embedding during the year and do some CFF as well. Um, and man, we're trying to help you win leagues in this off season right now get your money back already. Um, but in season, man, you quickly get your money back between props, betting DFS, um, and you get a great community. So it's, it's a great time with all of us. But with that, we have come to the end of our show. Thank you guys for listening. Our week number, our week one numbers were great. And that was because of you guys. And we really appreciate you guys continue to you guys supporting us. Um, and we would love for you to continue to support us by liking, commenting, subscribing um, on our channel. Um, we would love, and again, the comments, like we, we want to engage and interact with you guys. So any comments you have, we're going to get back to you and, and talk to you guys. And um, we really want to create a community more than anything else. So we'll see you guys back here next Thursday when we start diving into our top 10 rankings at each position, um, starting with the quarterback position. Until then, do small things with great love. 